Thank you, Andrew. John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. That's what we talked about in Sunday school this morning. That's what we're talking about today when we consider what does God's grace really mean? How big is it? How far-reaching is it? How deep does it go? So we're just saying His grace reaches me, it reaches us, and it reaches to the point of total salvation, of total change. If we believe it. That's our opportunity today. That's our message. Let's have a word of prayer and then we'll get into the text. Father, thank you so much for this body of believers that's here, has an opportunity to consider the truth in your scripture, Father, to consider Christ Jesus, your Son, who came, Father, and took on our flesh, and he did not have to, Father, but yet that was your, your choice to save us, Father, to send him, and he did that, Father, and he gave his life for us, Father, to redeem us all the way down, Father, and to raise us up all the way up to where he is seated in the heavenly places, Father. We pray that as we think about these things and consider these things, Father, that you will revive us and remind us of the joy of salvation, Father. Give us the assurance of salvation that the Holy Spirit confirms in our hearts, Father. If there are any seeking today, I pray, Father, that you will work in their hearts, convict them, Father, and reveal these things to them and reveal your goodness to them. We ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. One of my favorite painters is Winslow Homer, who is in the 1800s, and, and he painted a lot of images from around the area of Maine where he was, was living. He painted a lot about the, the ocean. Excuse me, I feel like I'm shouting up here. He painted a lot of scenes of the ocean, of the water, and I just love looking at, at pictures of the water and, and seeing the water. And he has this quote about painting, about artwork, which really, I think, applies to any creative activity, whether it's, it's woodworking, whether it's landscaping, whether it's, it's knitting or, or weaving. Any time you're making something and you're, you're seeking to, to stamp your, your touch on it, to let people know that this is something you've done, he says, when you paint, when you draw, when you do whatever it is you do, try to put down exactly what you see. Whatever else you have to offer will come out anyway. That's beautiful advice because there's so many of us who seek to do something unique. I want to do something different. I want to do something special. So I've got to think of something out of the box. And what he's saying is all of us have a different set of eyes. All of us come from a different walk of life. So all of us see the world in different ways based on the way we were raised, relationships we've had, things we've read, things we've learned. And he says just draw or paint or make what you see, because it's already unique. Whatever else you have to offer is going to come out anyway. I I spent some time working with a man in Springfield named Caleb Woodard, who has a wood shop. And if if any of you are familiar with him, the things that he makes, I I can't even, I could could never come up with the idea of, of the things that he makes, much less be able to put down the plans of how to actually make it. Even if I could dream it, I, I would have no ability to, to make it. If you're not familiar with him, I encourage you to, to drive by his, his shop there on Main Street sometime or, or look at his work online. He, he makes these um, cabinets and, and dressers that just have all of these, these uh, smooth curves and shapes, and, and he does it all, all with wood and, and shapes them. It's amazing to watch him uh, put these things together. And I spent just a little bit of time working with him and, and learning from him, and it taught me that whenever I see something that he has made, I don't have to ask who made this, because I already know, because his handiwork is present in it. And it's the same thing with the painting of Winslow Homer or, or Rembrandt or Vincent van Gogh or Claude Monet or any of these people who make these paintings. And it's the same way if you drive by a house in new construction, you say, I know who built that house. It's, it's such and such construction because they did it a certain way. They do their work a certain way and it stamps their handiwork, their craftsmanship on it. 
That's what Paul is saying here in the text that we're in today, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 10, that Andrew just read for us. And that's what he means when he says, we are God's workmanship, his handiwork. It doesn't just mean that when you look at us, you see the imprints of God's working. But when we further do good works in the world, we're demonstrating his hand, his work. And people see our lives and say, that's God's handiwork. That's God. He did that. So this is the point and this is the theme, the message of our text today. That we're not just pictures that hang on a wall like those paintings. We're not just furniture that sits in a room. But rather we were made to move. We were made to work, to do these good things so that, as Jesus says in in Matthew, so that men will see your good works and glorify God who's in heaven. So let's walk through this text together. Ephesians 2, verses 1. Remember, he's speaking specifically to Gentiles here, and he's talking about their former way of life before they were saved in Christ. He says, you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Do you hear what God is doing, what he's bestowing, what he has prepared for those who love him, who seek him? For by grace you have been saved, verse 8, through faith. And this is not your own doing. You don't get to take credit for this. It is the gift of God. Not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. He's saying that before Christ, you were literally like the walking dead. You were walking and there was no life in you. Even though you thought you were alive, even though you thought you were living, internally you were dead. There was no life. He says, but once you stepped into Christ and put your faith into Christ, you finally had a path. You finally had a purpose. And I want you to pause here and think about what he's talking about there in verse 2 when he says, before this, when you were dead, you were following the course of the, the, the spirit, the prince of power that is working in the power of the air, the spirit that's working in the sons of disobedience. Now I want you to think about this for a minute and ask you this question. How often do you think about spiritual warfare? Sometimes when we say that, we think, okay, we're talking to a snake oil salesman here. But how often do you really think about the fact that there's spiritual warfare going on in the world? Do we actually believe, when we talk about Satan as it were, do we believe that Satan is actively working to steer human affairs toward destruction? I don't really think we do, because part of it is we grew out of the Enlightenment age where we think so much about the intellect and rationality. We think about science and, and the world and creation as working in this intellectual way. We don't think about things in a spiritual perspective. But before that, and even today in many countries in the East, they still think about things in this way. And if we're not able and willing to think about the world in this way, we're going to have trouble with Ephesians later when he begins to talk about putting on the armor of God. It's not just preparing your mind for action, it's preparing your spirit and praying that God will shelter you from Satan who is, as Peter would say, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. There was a missionary in, in Europe during World War II and the Cold War named Richard Wormbrand who lived to be 90 years old, but 91, I believe, but actually during this time, during World War II and, and the Cold War, he worked as a missionary in Europe, especially fighting against the Marxist ideology in some of these socialist and communist regimes. And he wrote this book in 1986, later on after this time, called Marx and Satan. That's a 
pretty big title. It's a pretty bold statement. And what he argues there, he argues for the satanic influence in the ideology of Marxism. And he gets into it, and he gets into some of the texts and some of the things, the writings of Karl Marx, and talking about how at one time he grew up in a Jewish family, but gradually began to openly hate God. He was writing poetry talking about his, his hatred for God. And you, you see these similar things in, in regimes of, of men like Vladimir Lenin and Joseph Stalin talking about saying, down with religion, up with, with atheism. Uh, like Marx's mentor, Moses Hess, was an open Satanist. And so what Wormbrand is arguing in this text is that when you look at the mass death in these regimes, and if if you're not a child of history, think about things you've heard. Go back to history class and think about some of these regimes that have come through time under men like Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin, uh, Mao Zedong in in China. Talking about millions and millions of deaths under these regimes and darkness in these countries. So much so that Lenin, at the end of his life, as he's on his deathbed, he's quoted with saying that he's, he's, ha- he's, he's having this dream that he's in a pool of, of blood from all of the victims, and he can't escape it. And he, he says there on his, on his deathbed, we would have needed men like St. Francis of Assisi to save Russia. He said 10 men like Francis of Assisi could have saved Russia. And he's looking back and, and saying... It's too late. It's too late. All of this death came. And what Wormbrand was trying to say is, don't miss what's happening here. These weren't just ideas. When you think about war and when you think about violence and and all of these dark ideas that spread in the world that, that create violence and destruction, he's saying, think about these things from a spiritual perspective. And don't think for a second that Satan is not involved in this in some way. This is where we have to challenge ourselves to, to think about these things as, oh, that's, that's just a, a bad thing that happened, or we think about it intellectually, but, but realize that Satan is actively cheering destruction on when it's happening in the world, that he's at work. That's what Paul is saying here. He's saying that when you were dead following the prince of the power of the air. You didn't realize it, but Satan was laying out stepping stones in front of you, and you were just walking along in them. You had no idea what you were doing because you didn't have your spiritual eyes open. That's why Paul says in the previous passage that when when Christ comes, the eyes of your heart are enlightened, flooded with light. Shakespeare said that this, this sort of life in, in Macbeth's soliloquy he said it's, it's a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. This is life without God. It's blind, it's, it's empty, and it's depressing. Maybe you're feeling depressed with this message so far. Fortunately, that's not the end of the story. Verse 4, but God being rich. Think about that word. Not just that he has mercy in his hands to sprinkle, but he's rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us. And remember this and listen to this. Think about John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he sent his son. He's not saying that all of this happened and then he loved us. He says God loved the world in this way. He loved his creation. And out of that love, he sent Christ to redeem to bring us back. And we think about, you know, could God ever really love me? Could God ever really value me? The proof is in the pudding. He does, and He shows it in Jesus Christ and what He has done. Because of His mercy and His great love for us, He bestows this gift of grace on us as we just sang about. Think about those songs that we sang. Amazing grace. His grace reaches me. As Brennan Manning uh, said, a writer who was thinking about these things, and and Thomas Merton also, who who thought so much about about grace, they they said, all is grace. All is gift. 
you think about everything that God has done. We can't claim any of it and say, yeah, I, I did some of that. All of it is God's gift. So I want you to think back to our first sermon in this series when we talked about the just man has his freedom in his life, not because he knows that he's done something right, but because he knows that when he looks at God and when God looks at him, God sees Christ. Not because we are Christ, because we've done great things, but because when we put our faith in him, we put on Christ's clothes, essentially. We step and stand in Christ. And when God looks at us, he sees the holiness of Christ simply through our faith in him. This is his gift to us. And when we doubt our salvation, when we doubt our good standing with God, or when we fail to experience the joy of it, we're undermining His gift. It's like, say you're someone who walks to work every day and someone gives you a car. And you say, it's a great car. I'm just going to keep walking to work. That's what it's like when we say to God, is your salvation really, does it go that deep? Does it change completely? Does it really offer joy like David talked about? Restore to me the joy of my salvation. If we fail to experience that and fail to share that with people who are seeking, who really want to know what Jesus is all about, then we're undermining his gift and saying, it's really not as good as you say it is, God. That's a dangerous place to be. Paul is saying, by grace you have been saved. This is not your own doing. It's the gift of God. All is grace. God has done all the work. And so finally, when we think about what he says there at the end, that we are God's workmanship, that we are God's handiwork, as the NIV says. The NLT says we are his masterpiece. I think that gets close to think of us as his masterpiece. But we have to push that further when he says we are his workmanship. Because it's not just that we get to stand here and say, I'm a masterpiece that God made. No, we walk and do good to others and spread his love, and that's his masterpiece. We are masterpiece makers. We are image spreaders. We are good workers because of the good work that he has done in us. Do you believe this? How deeply does this sink into your heart when you read these passages? Is it old news to you? Or every time we read it, every time we think about these things, does it revive that joy in you? Let's pray. Father, I've said all I have to say here. And I pray, Father, that you have been working in this moment, this moment that you knew would come this day. You were already here, Father, before we arrived. You were before us. You're after us. You're the beginning and the end, Father. And I know that ultimately true change in people's hearts is nothing that I can do from screaming or, or yelling or banging on a pulpit, Father, but it's all your Spirit's work. And so I pray that as we consider this message and consider these things, Father, that your Spirit is doing your work, the holy work, shaping us into the body of Christ and of convicting people of sin, pointing them back to you, Father. And all of this happens because of our shared faith in Jesus Christ. We ask this in the power of his name. Amen. Amen. It's a short sermon, and it's yours, and like many of the other sermons we've walked through in the book of Ephesians, really the message is pretty simple. God loves us. He's given us His grace, and He sent Jesus to redeem us. And the invitation is, do you believe it? Will you accept it? You choose to live your life in obedience. Simple as that. Many of you have already put your faith in Christ. And so I'm praying for you, and I ask that you will pray for yourself to feel that joy of your salvation that David talked about. To really experience the assurance of it that we talked about in Sunday school this morning. And if you are seeking, 
you're considering these things, I pray that you will seek him out. Scripture says that he rewards those who diligently seek him. I encourage you to seek him. We have this moment of invitation where we'll pray with you. I'd love to pray with you. If you'd like to come up to me afterwards and say, pray with me privately or just through the week, I'd love to do that because I've been praying for each of you anyway. My kids have as well. I have note cards with your names on them. I've been praying for you. So if you have something specific to pray about, I'd love to because I'm going to be praying for you anyway. We have an invitation now. Let's come and stand and sing.